Welcome everyone to the Coin Brief Podcast, number 19. I'm Sean Wentz. And I'm Evan Faggart. Every week we talk about, well, actually, we've actually been off for two <laughs> weeks. <laughs> well, only um, one week. Yeah, uh, took a week off. Um, Evan, you you uh, you went on an epic uh, journey uh, through the mountains. No, it sucked. I got really sick. I got some like respiratory virus. Oh, damn. It's not Ebola, yeah. right? No, I'd, I'd probably be dead by now. So. Okay. I'm good. They put me on medicine, so I'm good. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, good thing you're well now. Um, for me, I, I basically I took a week and uh, didn't really pay attention to any Bitcoin news at all. I stopped checking the price. I turned off the price notifier on my phone. Um, just kind of check out for a little bit and then come back and see how things are doing. Um, so we're we're back in the, it's the middle of October now of 2014, and um, we're going to talk about some of the latest stories that came out uh, this past week. And also mention a couple things that happened as well as two weeks ago, like like the bear whale situation that happened on Bitstamp <laughs> and froze the Bitcoin price at three hundred dollars. Um, but uh, first, let's uh, let's start out with a kind of a scandal that happened recently um, concerning Bitcoin ATMs. So, Robocoin is an ATM company that ships uh, and manufactures Bitcoin ATMs. And apparently, some customers have been having issues with uh, getting the machines on time, um, getting them in any reasonable amount of time. So this one guy posted a story, expose basically, on Reddit a few days ago, where he talked about how he bought a Robocoin Bitcoin ATM uh, back in December for $20,000. And it, it was supposed to ship in March. It didn't ship in March, and then he started having email correspondence back and forth with the CEO, or uh, just some kind of support team, and like they kept making excuses, like not getting the right supplies from from their supplier, like Fujitsu wasn't giving them the supplies early enough, and like they were just corresponding back and forth for a few months, and eventually it reaches like September. And now October, and still haven't received it. So they decided to go back and take screenshots of the email correspondence and, like, basically post the whole long thing onto Reddit and basically, you know, put Robocoin in the spotlight for not shipping the machines on time. Um, this is, I think, this is pretty surprising because Robocoin, like, was the first major. Uh, company to get in the ATM space, I think, and like they were get like a lot of people thought they were pretty legitimate. A lot of mainstream news agencies covered Robocoin. You know, now we have Bitcoin ATMs. People can buy and sell Bitcoin easily at a machine in a coffee shop. All this stuff. Um, but it's just an it's unfortunate and surprising now to see like a huge um, expose come out about this basically labeling them as like doing the same kind of things that butterfly labs was doing for the longest time of getting these massive you know thousand dollar orders from customers and taking months upon months to ship out the product like and and then the customer starts feeling like they're never going to get the product and like you know they ask for refunds and then and then they don't want to give a refund either so yeah um Apparently, uh, yesterday though, the the CEO actually responded and said that like he's he's very sorry, he's totally responsible for all of this, and you know, gave a gave finally gave the refund after the whole thing went public on Reddit and the person um, got their twenty five thousand dollars back. So, what do you think, Evan, about this um, latest scandal to hit the industry? Seems kind of sad because Robocoin is basically the biggest uh, ATM manufacturer, right? There's Robocoin and then Lamasau, or however you say it. Yep, those and, are two big ones right there. And apparently, Robocoin. I don't want to call it like I don't want to call it a scam because you know it might have, maybe they didn't do it on purpose, but it's still you know pretty. You know, pretty terrible customer service at the very least. Bad um, business. 
And the Reddit, there's, you know, you showed me this Reddit or whoever like screen capped all these emails and in the comment section the top the very like the very top comment was from an op uh, from a guy or a person who says uh, he's an operator of a Robocoin machine and they have this this guy's had terrible service too he's, he says he's had problems with the ID scanner the palm scanner and the software and then they have terrible customer support uh, so yeah like Robocoin is, you know, the like leading company in uh, developing Bitcoin ATM hardware and software, and they have all these like fancy security measures, like you know, like the palm scanner, like you know, three levels of of ID verification and all this. Yeah. And um, but then they pull something like this, and it really ruins the reputation. Yeah, and like. It's definitely true that like starting an ATM company like this is not easy at all. Like you do have to implement like all of these stringent security measures and you have to like definitely register as like a money transmitter business with FinCEN and all this stuff and and you know make sure that you're collecting enough information about your customers to satisfy the government. So like there's a lot of pitfalls involved in in doing this company and doing it right but that still doesn't excuse you from like giving refunds on time like if you aren't able to get the parts together in a reasonable amount of time and, and get it shipped out like w within a month of the expected delivery date that you told your customer like okay you, you're running a hard company like it's, it's hard to do this and get 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 the products out on time but like if you can't do it and your customer wants a refund, do it like immediately. Like how how hard is that to just wire? I mean, maybe it is kind of hard given the legacy financial system, but like just get the twenty thousand dollars to them and, and be done with the thing before. Like if they like on September fifteenth, right? Uh, the CEO assured the customer that the refund was on the way and he would have it to them within a week. And then, like, they decide to go public on September 29th because they didn't get the refund. Like, just mistake after mistake after mistake, like, eventually your customer, who who's getting screwed this year, you know, out $25,000, like, you're just, you're, you're pressuring them to go public with this. And you're pressuring them to um, basically make your company look bad by, by going public with this horrible customer service. So it's like... I mean, it's it's a, it's a definitely a knock to their to their image and a knock to their legitimacy, and like they're still doing fine now, but it's it's definitely it's it's a it's a nick against their reputation. Well, you know, I think another thing uh, we have to realize is that a lot of people in the Bitcoin community are really quick to. Um, yell scam at any Bitcoin business that has a, like a slight hiccup. Uh, but what's important to realize, and uh, you know, not that this necessarily applies to Bitcoin, but a lot of these Bitcoin businesses, the people that run them, aren't really, may not really be very experienced in running a business, because um, you know, a lot of these Bitcoin uh, services and Bitcoin-related goods were just people like having fun with their friends like seeing what they could do with the bitcoin technology or seeing what things they could build to go alongside the bitcoin technology and then when bitcoin blew up their projects blew up and they turned into like you know actual businesses so maybe maybe some of these companies don't really have like you know the the proper properly trained employees or management or whatever and so yeah. When they get when they get backed up, they don't know like they don't know how to act. Um, yeah, I don't know anything about the people who run RoboCoin, so that may or may not be the case. I don't know, depending on you know who runs it. But yep. I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, especially with the the mining machine, the mining rig manufacturers like Butterfly Labs. Um, th those people definitely fit into to that you know kind of narrative uh, bitcoin mining rigs were 
you know, just a fun, like a fun little project that came out of necessity as the supply increased. But then all of a sudden, as the price shot up, everybody wanted. Uh, and then all of a sudden, um, these companies are like multi-million dollar businesses, but th it's the same people who are like running them out of their basement. Yep. So, you know, the, we're still in the early stages of the Bitcoin economy. And so these businesses aren't going to be, aren't exactly going to be the most professional uh, gang of, gangs of people around. Uh, there, it's just going to be people who are doing this in their free time, and all of a sudden, because they like, thought Bitcoin was interesting, right? Yeah, like maybe like I they, can do something interesting with this. Like they're having fun working a normal job or going to school, and then all of a sudden, um, like, whoa, I'm making millions of dollars selling my uh, mining rigs, but I'm not really sure how to handle all the you know customer demand and stuff because I'm just you know I'll, I flip burgers at McDonald's or whatever you know or. <laughs> I answer phones for a living, whatever. Yeah. So uh, there's definitely a learning curve to running a business like that when you're not, you know, trained to do it. Yeah. So, you know, maybe that applies to RoboCoin, maybe it doesn't, but it's just something to think about before you start accusing people of running scams. You know, maybe they're just making honest mistakes. Yeah, yeah, we should try and, like, keep the knee-jerk reactions down to a minimum. And s scam, that's a, that's a heavy loaded word, like... <laughs> Even Butterfly Labs, it'd be difficult to label them categorically, like de definitively a scam because they did ship the rigs out to a lot of people. A lot of people did get their rigs on time. It's just that there's, you know, there's like a minority who never got the rigs and, you know, are out thousands and thousands of dollars. And like those, like those are the people who, who really have to go public with their exper their bad experience with the company because, number one, it, it pushes the company to be better. And number two, like it, it just gives more information out in the public about like how this business deals with its customers, and like it supports the it supports the free market um, philosophy, right? Like now that all of this information has gone public, people are saying, okay, please, anyone else who who hasn't gotten their robo coins yet, you know, come forward with your problems, and like that's kind of. The, like a lot, the only way to get things done a lot of the time is by going public with the fact that you're out twenty thousand dollars from this company, and you know publicly shame them into changing their ways. Um, and you know, is that is that like a better way to change a company's practices than going to the government and trying to get the government to change them? Yeah, that's actually pretty. Good point. Um, a lot of a lot of anti free market people argue that um, businesses won't be stopped from doing bad things because um, the customers just won't realize it because they're too dumb to realize it or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. But we see that we you know we see this happening all the time in the Bitcoin community because um, obviously, like I said just a second ago, a lot of a lot of these people aren't really that great at running businesses, and then there's some people, um, Mark Carpel is allegedly, who are just you know outright scammers, and they're out to steal people's money, um, allegedly. allegedly. And uh, so, so I mean, this is just proof that no, we're not, um, we're not too dumb to take care of ourselves. When something bad happens, we tell everybody about it, and then, um, and then the free market does regulate itself because people do boycott businesses. They stop buying their products. They demand their money back. Um, and yeah, that's definitely a better way to go <clears throat> about changing a company's behavior because when you get the government involved, um, what is the government going to do? Well, they're going to send first, first they're going to create an agency for the particular situation and they're going to hire a million people and then they're going to steal money from you so they can fund it. Um, then they're going to pay to those bureaucrats to sit at a desk, right? Yep. And yep. fill out paperwork. Um, and then um, that's what they do the majority of the time. But in the rare instance where some some kind of fraud or scam actually does happen, they'll send you know two or three people out to the company. Um, they will fix the problem for them. I uh, charge them a nominal fee for their service of fixing the problem for them. Uh, they're going to call it a fine, but it's really just a business expense. 
Um, and then they're going to say, okay, you're good to go. And then they're going to tell the public, um, no, we fixed the problem. This business is totally legitimate now. And then when the company's yeah. going to go back and doing the same thing before, but the public has been duped into uh, believing that this company is now legitimate because the government said so and the people would trust the government. Um, but the same people are still running the business. Um, so they still have the same motivations, the same ideas, and they're going to do the same thing again. Uh, but in the free market, if something like this happens, um, customers are the most ruthless, unforgiving people who exist on this planet. Um, uh, just just because of the the nature of business and the economy, you know, in order to make money, you have to treat the customer like they're always right. That's where that comes from. The customer is always right because that's the person you have to, you have to satisfy to make money. Um, so if you do something wrong and you piss off a customer, that person is going to go and tell all of their friends. They're going to post it all over social media. Then they're going to refuse to buy your product, and their friends are going to do the same thing. And that seriously hurts your bottom line. So, um, and when there's no government, uh, there's not going to be anybody to come in and fix the problem for you, and then assure the public that everything's okay. So really, their only choice is to. Um, you know, get their stuff in order and get it together and um, provide a valuable service or go out of business. That's what, you know, that's what the free market does. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's really crazy how social media now is enabling this, like this brand new, like effective means of disseminating information, you know, from, from customers who have bad experiences with companies and can go public about it and be like, this this is a problem and then you know that like back in the day you would have had to rely on a newspaper to break a story about like customers getting screwed by a company or something like that now like just go to reddit and you see all the you know all the alleged scams that are happening in in a in this brand new financial industry so like kind of demonstrates that we don't necessarily need the government to go in there with guns and uh and you know, telling them to, to ship it out or to wire transfer $20,000 or whatever. So pre pretty interesting development in the, yeah. I mean, the, the guy, space. the guy who ran RoboCoin or I don't know, was this guy running it or was he just like some kind of manager or something? I don't yeah. I don't know, but he, it's, it's he, the CEO. Okay. Based on well, the emails. He, um, he paid the money back just because he felt bad and people were mad at him. You know, nobody forced him to do it. So, well, and, I mean, and great, he probably figured, like, if I don't pay this back, like, my yeah. business is screwed. I need to yeah. salvage what little goodwill I can still salvage from the community and just give them their money back. Like, that's worth that's worth it to him. Yeah, if he didn't, um, he would either get fired or, or his business would tank. So, yeah, he could have, you know, he could have just been like, okay. Uh, screw this, like, now the jig is up, <laughs> like, they know that I'm not shipping out all the machines, um, I'm not gonna pay back, screw these guys on Reddit, I don't, I don't need their support, and he would probably still keep making some sales for a while, but eventually, if you keep doing shady stuff, then people are gonna catch on to it, and it's gonna hurt your business, and it's like, well, apparently he's, uh, his name is Jordan Kelly, I should have mentioned this earlier, but, you know, CEO Jordan Kelly has done the right thing, you know, giving back the twenty five thousand yep. dollars and um you know i like if he was a truly nice guy he would have paid back with interest because they've been out that money <laughs> since december <Yeah. laughs> but hey you know give him back yep. the twenty five thousand and if it's good they paid with bitcoin you know that well actually the bitcoin would be worth a lot less but it, i was gonna say interest would be even more justified because if they paid with bitcoin it would have gone up in value a lot but if it was December, if they paid for it in December, it'd be worth a lot. Actually, less. that yeah, if if he had paid back in Bitcoin, that would have been actually pretty great for the customer. Right? Yeah, because <laughs> they're getting they're basically getting more Bitcoin back uh, compared to what they paid in December. Definitely. Um, but yeah, uh, good luck, Robocoin, with your future endeavors. <laughs> um, so let's move on to the next story, uh, which is about Dorian Satoshi Nakamoto. The uh, supposed creator of Bitcoin, according to Newsweek magazine. So 
this happened back in what was it March or April, where Newsweek yeah sometime around then Newsweek put out this story by Leah Goodman, alleging that this guy living in California, named Dorian Nakamoto, uh, created Bitcoin and like he, apparently he he did it during his like ten years of unemployment, you know, uh, in the two thousands. And, you know, he previously worked for, like, uh, large uh, defense contractors and, like, the RAND Corporation and, you know, heavily funded, uh, like, um, security companies, kind of, like, uh, electronic security companies. So, it, you know, it kind of kind of, kind of made sense that yeah. he might be the creator yeah, he, of Bitcoin. He's a programmer. Yeah, he's, he's a, a programmer. He's a programmer. He wrote code. Wrote code, and uh, so like he seems like he could have the knowledge and the skill set to create Bitcoin, and it seemed to kind of fit. Um, and obviously, his name is Dorian Satoshi Nakamoto. So they're basically alleging that this guy just didn't mention his first name when he was posting online about Bitcoin, and like that would be pretty bold move based on someone trying to do this but you know it's possible and it, and it, it was plausible based based on the evidence that they presented in the article but it it wasn't proven it wasn't even close to proven that he was satoshi nakamoto that created bitcoin so now it's come out that dorian uh is raising money to sue newsweek for um for trying to identify him as someone that he says that he is not that person. Um, it's it's the Dorian's Legal Defense Fund, and uh, it's authorized and endorsed by Dorian, and he has an attorney for this. And, yeah, he's, he's trying to sue them to basically discourage them, I guess, from you know, trying to identify other people in the future, like, as, like, like, a, as part of a witch hunt, you know, and not even prove that they're the person that they say they are. So, um, what do you, what do you think about this? That, uh, are they, is he suing Newsweek for damages or is he claiming that they broke a law? You know, I'm not sure. It's not really clear based on the business insider, um, article. Um, Dorian Nakamoto is trying to strike back at Newsweek. Uh, the California man is attempting to sue the magazine that they, they published a cover story. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really say like if they're seeking damages, or if it's that they broke a, broke a law. I think if they broke a law, a federal agency um, would be involved. But it's just a civil case between Nakamoto and Newsweek. So it, it does kind of make you wonder, like, what's what is their justification and like what would be their justification for um, monetary reward, you know, that might be rewarded to them based on this? Like, first of all, first of all, do you think that Dorian Nakamoto is Satoshi Nakamoto? No. No? Okay. No, I don't, I don't think, I don't think Satoshi would be stupid enough to use his real name when his whole thing was about anonymity on the internet. Okay, yeah, that's that's a pretty good point, um, but like for this for this case, like I don't know, would would Dorian Nakamoto have to try and prove that like there's no possible way he could be Satoshi? Like, would he have to provide like an alibi of sorts for like that he's not Satoshi? Because I mean, based on the article, it is possible. It's possible that he's Satoshi. There's a chance. So how can you go into court and say unequivocally that you are not this person and that like like you deserve some kind of um uh re reward or monetary reward for damages against your character or or something like you can't really claim libel or or something like that like I don't I don't know really what the base of the case is but like they're looking for support. They're looking for donations to um, fund this case. They're accepting donations and credit, debit card, Bitcoin. Um, so they're they're going for the jugular in Netflix in um, uh, Newsweek. I think I think uh, most likely uh, he's just suing them. He's just suing Newsweek, claiming probably claiming that um, 
Newsweek created hardship for him and his family for like invading their lives and then uh. Uh, writing that article and then like getting all that unwanted attention on them. But he got a free lunch. But, <clears throat> yeah, he made a bunch of money off of it because people donated it. Um, well, not a bunch of money, but he got several dollars donated to him. Uh, but, well, of course, that was after people were kind of like, hey, this isn't actually Nakamoto, and it was kind of messed up what that woman did to him. So, um, mm. But, you know, you have to th- think about it. Um, Dorian's, Dorian's brother uh, and daughter and what other... Uh, whatever other family members talked to him, they willingly did it. And uh, unless... Willingly unless, did what? Did uh, interviews and stuff? Yeah, did the interviews. And unless um, Leah Goodman lied about who she was, they knew it was for Newsweek. Uh, so they knew it was going to be big. So, um, so really, like... W- and Dorian, Dorian talked to her, talked to Leah Goodman too, right? So he obviously volunteered to do it. He did it willingly. Nobody yeah. pointed a gun at his head. Um, just because it blew up a little more than he wanted it to doesn't mean that he's, something was forced on him against his will. Yeah. But um, I do think it was pretty. I, I mean, I think it was poor journalism what Leah Goodman did. Um, because she found a guy who's who's part of his name was Satoshi Nakamoto. He was a computer programmer and he was a libertarian. She took those three pieces of information and just jumped to the conclusion that he invented Bitcoin. Um, that's that's really really poor journalism. But I don't know if that's something to sue somebody over. Right. Um, maybe I mean maybe there's more to the story than I'm getting right now because when the, when the, when this all came out I was very very new into bitcoin like I the article was published 2 or 3 weeks after I started following bitcoin maybe uh like following it closely so you know I don't I obviously don't know the full story cuz I wasn't that um you know invested in it but from what I can tell now it's just like you know, he, he, they, his family willingly did all these things. They willingly talked to Leah Goodman, and um, it got more attention than they anticipated. So now they're trying to like blame somebody for it. Yeah, and you know, I guess that it might it might bring some um, unneeded stress on their life, especially if there are like a lot of people out there who see this news story come out, and then it does convince them that that he is Satoshi Nakamoto. And then take the extra leap where you th- say that Satoshi Nakamoto still has, like, you know, tens of thousands of Bitcoins stashed from, like, early, the very first mining days. So, like, there might be some people out there who would try and maybe go to his house uh, and, like, try and break in, you know, access his, his computer yeah. or something like that. So, like, uh, you know there's no evidence that that has happened or anything like that. We would have heard about it, but it's some extra stress on the family's lives. Like, man, now, now there's a group of people out there who think that we are mega rich and that our riches are just stored on a hard drive in, in the, in the house somewhere. So that's that, I guess that is a, that is a big deal. And like, they would definitely have like a, a much stronger case. If like something like that did happen to them, like then you could, if someone did break into their house and try and steal a hard drive or something, then they could definitely go to court and be like, okay, great. Thanks to Newsweek, people think that we're mega rich and we have riches stored on a hard drive and people broke in. That's, like, that's, I mean, that's, like, seriously irresponsible journalism leading to someone's life being negatively impacted. Um, so maybe, you know, maybe they're trying to trying to get ahead of that and and they might make that case in court. To try and support their argument. Yeah, um, I didn't really look at much of the discussion that went on on Reddit from that. I, I read a couple comments, but um, were, were the people like generally uh, generally supportive of Dorian? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And I, uh, saw, I mean, people were I mainly s- just totally 
against Newsweek. Like there was rage yeah. against Newsweek and Leah Goodman for for doing this story. Yeah, I saw one person comment that um, that this actually they pointed out that that this fund was being team. So this wasn't actually Dorian's idea. The legal team was just trying to profit off his hardship. Hmm. Which kind of kind of an interesting comment. But um I mean, I'm glad that everyone has realized that Leah Goodman did some like really bad journalism, but I don't I don't know if that's enough to like get sued for, you know, you Yeah. You wrote a bad article, like, oh, I'm going to sue you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it might set a weird precedent if they do win, win in court. Yeah. Like, now now anyone who gets uh, an article written about them, if it's not totally proven, then they can sue the publisher in court. Um, that, that, would, that would be a weird precedent. And <laughs> I, I guess, you know, based on that argument, like, it depends on the arguments they make in court, but I don't know, I don't know how successful... Um, this lawsuit is going to be, or what it's really, really going to achieve. Um, so, shall we move on to the next story? Yeah. Um, so, bit license drama continues. Um, we're pretty much we're we're reaching the deadline, pretty much of of the of the bit license. Um, I think we we might have already passed the comment period, and they're going to release the the final draft soon. Um, but now, like, this is, we have a new, we have a new ally in the fight against the bit license, and that is the Electronic Fron uh, Frontier Foundation. The EFF defends your digital rights, or the, your rights in the digital world. So, um, they have actually come out to oppose the bit license, and, um, you know, adopting the argument that, um, digital currency users shouldn't have to provide their personal information, you know, real name, home address, phone number, all that stuff, just to transact in digital currency, or to even um, innovate on digital currency or create a business, right? Like they shouldn't have to go through all that and then pay a fine, uh, not a fine, but a fee to get a license and be approved by the state of New York to transact in, digi transact in digital currency. So, um, pretty, pretty big ally now in the EFF, um, doing this, I would have liked for them to come out and, you know, come out with this stance earlier because it's kind of late in the game now, but, um, it's yeah. good to have them on board. And the EFF is a really good organization that, um, you know, fights for privacy rights on the internet, um, and all these other things that try and promote freedom Whereas, you know, corporations and, and governments are constantly trying to restrict freedom on the internet. And the EFF is a, is a good guy in this, in this fight. And uh, they're taking the side of Bitcoin, in this case, against the New York uh, DFS. Yeah, like you said, if they, if they had uh, came out with this position a little bit earlier, it would have been, it would have been uh, way better because they have the potential to raise a lot of awareness on the issue because they're actually you know a fairly large organization that, and they've received a lot of attention lately because of the uh, Edward Snowden um, whole NSA thing going on because it was I, I saw it reported several times that Edward Snowden was a contributor to um, the EFF so they got a lot of publicity there and then they they've also became uh, pretty popular because of their stance on net neutrality. I think because they support net neutrality. Yeah. So, so yeah, they have you know a pretty, they're you know they're pretty popular. They have a pretty big uh, base of people to spread their ideas to. So if they came out against bit license earlier, we could have had like. Um, an entire group of people supporting the Bitcoin community that we don't have now, but, True. you know, pop, maybe, maybe we'll still get some of that support, but you know, it is kind of late. I think, I think that, um, I think the commenting period has passed and if not, it'll definitely be, it'll definitely be next week. 
Uh, yeah, we're getting down to the wire with this one. Yeah. So, but is they have NYDFS hasn't said anything about any edit like. After they released the second draft, they haven't said anything about any additional uh, public commenting periods or anything, have they? Right. Yeah. This is it. This is it. Um, so like, what? So, whatever they. So they had the first proposal, and whatever they come up with now, that's just what they're gonna put into law. Yeah, pretty much. Like it's they're gonna release the final draft, and businesses will have, I think it's about a month, to comply, and then after that it's it's law like if you're not if you're not complying then they can take you down <laughs> god how messed up is that like it's it's a bunch of people we that the people of new york haven't voted for creating laws that the elected representatives in new york aren't going to vote on it's just it's going to be law automatically <laughs> yeah that's that's it's, not that's not democracy at all, you know. Yeah, like the the argument is, you know, people who would justify this system, they would say, "Oh, well, the people of New York elected Governor Cuomo, and then Cuomo appointed Ben Lasky to the NYDFS. So that's there's your representation. You should be happy with it. Don't vote for Cuomo next time if you don't want to support Ben Lasky." No, even. Even then, at the very least, those appointees should be approved by the state legislature, like it is on the federal level. Whenever the president appoints somebody, it has to be approved by the Senate. Mm. Um, so there is that. There is still a level of um, not democracy, but republicanism, because uh, we're actually a, repub a republic, not a right. democracy. Yeah. Uh, so there's, but there's just got to be some level. I mean. If we're going to have any government at all, which anybody who watches our videos knows that I'm skeptical of any government at all, but if there's going to be, if there is going to be a government, it has to be representative on some level, right? Like we can't just let them do what. Yeah, um, it's it's representative on some level, a very small level, and a. <laughs> steadily decreasing influence level <laughs> yeah an increasingly small level because less and less people are voting so and and more and more corporations are voting with their money oh yeah That's not, the other not side only not only are less people do less people care but um we have a limited range of choices before you know we even get started so that's a big problem too yep whoever has the most money wins yeah. I believe uh, someone did a study for on the Congress, um, like whoever has the most money in one particular like congressional race wins like ninety four percent of the time. Yep, that, I mean that's a big reason why and in, why incumbents win like ninety eight percent of the time, or whatever it is, because they have more money, you know. They yep. Well, they can mail things for free. They have access to um, the official party's funds. You know, yeah, it's and you know taking this back to New York specifically, um, Andrew Cuomo is like one of the richest Democrats in like all of American politics right now. Like I don't know have the exact figures, but like he has tons of backing from corporations. He's got the backing of the big banks in Wall Street. Um, you know, by extension, so does Ben Lasky. So. There you have it. That's that's why they're willing to do these completely ridiculous regulations on digital currency. Um, uh, bringing it, you know, also bringing it back to the EFF argument. Like they make the argument that like there's two there's two sides to this. Like first of all, there's the people, there's the businesses who are gonna have to get a license um, to transact in digital currency. But then there's the, also the other side of all the customers and regular users who associate with those businesses who don't have to get a license, but they do have to give up all of their personal information and basically lose all their privacy. Like not only, you know, every time they transact in digital currency, that's going to be on a record somewhere, but their name is going to be attached to that. Their address is going to be attached to that, their phone. Net, their phone number is going to be attached to that. So even if you don't have to, get a license and go through all the onerous regulations to just do business and innovate. Um, even if you're just someone who's using that business, you're going to lose your privacy. So 
hey, you don't lose money, but you're going to lose your privacy. It's still going to affect you. It's still going to be a negative overall for, for the community. So, And privacy is a really big deal, too. Like, uh, privacy is a huge... It's a huge requirement for being able to live your life as an individual. You you have to be able to, um, you know, you have to be able to keep certain things private because you know there there's some some people like to live their lives a certain way and where if other people found out about it, they'd be completely ostracized and they you know mm-hmm. in a lot of cases they would be physically harmed like uh, you know gay people for instance you know for the longest time the only thing that kept them alive was their privacy mm-hmm. because you know they can they did their business in uh, behind closed doors in private and um, and tried to act as normal as possible yeah in public. And, and then you know the bigots didn't know about it so you know they were safe but you know just imagine if there was a law where um, you had to like register your full name social security number and like the names of every uh, sexual partner you've ever had or whatever mm. um, that, that's that's essential money um, you know we 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 wouldn't we wouldn't accept that kind of regulation for something you know like for people like people we've had uh, sex with you know so why are we accepting it uh, for something that's you know it, an equally central part of our lives, what we do with our money. Financial privacy. You know? yeah. 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 Like, <clears throat> what we do with our money says just as much about who we are as who we sleep with. So, why do, why do we accept complete government intrusion in one, in one aspect of our lives, but not the other? Yeah. I. <laughs> good question. Um, more, probably kind of a rhetorical question, but I'm going to tackle it anyway. Um, like, you know, I think that based on the current system, like a lot of people have just gotten used to the fact that like all of their electronic finances are completely monitored and, and every transaction is, is tracked. You know, they can just log into their bank account and, and check, you know, all their current, you know, all their recent purchases and everything. So it's like people don't even have like a, a standard to look to in terms of like what financial privacy actually looks like in the digital age. We've never, we've never seen anything like that. And um, and Bitcoin kind of enables that for the first time, uh, in a way. Like even though the blo- the blockchain is totally public and you can go look at any transaction you want, um, the individual people using it, it's really, really, really difficult to identify uh, individual people and their transactions. And in some cases, it's just it's just straight up impossible, especially if you use privacy uh, tools. And um, the Bit license is trying to trying to add some identification to that and we aren't going to see any kind of huge uproar over this from the general public but um yeah luckily the EFF is on board now with this with this uproar against the crazy regulations of the bit license yeah you know you like you say you say it's just um like zero expectation of privacy in our financial business has become just like um, the norm in our current, you know, social economy. Um, but and and that's true on the whole. But for me as an individual, it's the exact opposite because it's something I think about every single day. Like you know, it's it's a daily thought process for me. Every time I buy something uh, with my debit card, I the thought goes through my head like, there's somebody who knows exactly what I ate today. Yeah. Um, there's somebody who knows exactly what video games I'm playing at the moment, uh, or exactly what kind of movies I'm watching. Which stores you uh, shop at. Yeah, and like, what, people who have access to financial information, they know. They know what movies you like. They know what books you like to read. They know what music uh, you listen to. Um, they yeah. know what kind of friends you have because they know where you go. Like they know your entire life basically yeah and it's it's um, not necessarily that there's one guy out there who's looking at his computer and like watching your transactions on a screen or something but like that's all in a database yeah that can it's be available accessed. it's available to anybody who has access to it um and you know the number one group of people who you don't want to have access to it the government through the nsa uh they have access to it 
Um, so you can just go ahead and, and assume that somebody in the NSA knows what you like to eat for breakfast, knows what kind of underwear you like to wear, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so every single day I'm like, gosh, why couldn't I pay for this in Bitcoin? Like, why can't I buy this food in Bitcoin or whatever? Like, hmm. I, like, it just makes me feel so exposed, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's the, that's the credit card system for you. <laughs> They, you you have to you have to pay fees to have them store all your records. How do you like that? <laughs> yeah, um, like yeah, you get to pay them to take your privacy away. It's pretty great. <laughs> pretty awesome system. Yeah, great job, credit card companies. Good luck in the coming digital currency apocalypse where you're all gonna <laughs> go down. <laughs> yeah, give us some time. Or the zombie apocalypse where everything goes down. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. If that happens, that's, uh, yeah, that that's relevant because Walking Dead's back on, so that's why I brought it up. Oh, nice. I still haven't gotten into that. <laughs> oh, dude, it's awesome. Yeah, it's the greatest show ever made. Oh man, I gotta I gotta catch up. What is the fifth fifth season now? Yeah, I think so. Nice. I might just watch season one tonight after the podcast. It, yeah, it's on Netflix. Yeah. All right. Um. So hopefully uh, no apocalypse haps- happens and we can actually <laughs> achieve this awesome, justified, like, justice future with privacy and all that great stuff. But for now, we got to st- keep dealing with privacy intrusions and fighting against stuff like the bit license. Um, so speaking of privacy intrusions, you know, um, Apple and Google announced recently that they are <laughs> going to encrypt the smartphones by default and basically not allow anyone to uh, sneak in through back doors to access uh, you know your communications um, what you do with your apps you know your financial privacy like we talked about um, but once once they announced that the FBI came out and said that if companies like Apple and Google are allowed to encrypt by default, um, then that will mean that all of us will be in the dark concerning crime and that like people who use encryption put themselves above the law. Uh, and like the FBI is basically whining that they don't have automatic, uh, easy, all inclusive access to all of our data on our smartphones. Yeah. You're in danger because we can't spy on you. Yeah, what? pretty much. That's the argument. Yeah, the um, I think what this FBI guy actually said, um, I don't remember the exact quote, but it was along the lines of this puts um, society or by using this type of encryption, uh, we allow individuals to place themselves above the law, which creates a threat to society. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting uh, scare tactic. How, how on earth can you even like in any sense consider securing your private information to be considered? Like, how can you consider that placing yourself outside of the law by proactively protecting your legal rights guaranteed to you by the Fourth Amendment? Right. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and all like, these FBI people are supposed to swear and uphold the Constitution, right, when they enter office. Yeah, but then like, they're actively if, attacking it. You know, if if you need to get somebody's information um, and you have a warrant, uh, you know, then that person is legally obligated to give you the password. And if they don't give you the password, you can send them to prison. Like, there's already legal channels established by the Constitution to ensure that law enforcement can get the information, you know, when it's necessary to have that information. Yeah, if there's a serial killer on the loose, then it shouldn't be that hard to get a warrant to track him. Yeah, you know, it's not, um, it's not like encrypting information makes it go away forever under any circumstance. Uh, You know, there's a password to it. The person who encrypted that information obviously knows the password. Um, If you have reasonable suspicion um, that they are a criminal, you can obtain a warrant and force them to unlock their phone. 
you don't need a back door. You don't need to be able to, to look at this information whenever you feel like it without a warrant. Um, you know, that's not keeping people safe. That's becoming an Orwellian big brother. Yeah, um, I'm going to play a little bit of De Devil's Advocate, actually. Um, can you actually force someone to unencrypt their phone? Um, even if you have a warrant, like they can just be like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to enter the passcode, you know, like I'm not oh, going to, well, I'm not going to release it. If, if they don't, if they don't enter the password, uh, you know, then they can just throw you in prison, you know? Okay. Um, and the, and they'll say, you're going to stay in prison until you enter the password. It's, you know, it's the same idea as if, um, if somebody, if the police have a warrant to search, like, a safe that you have in your house. They, they get a warrant from the judge. It says, we, um, this police officer has permission to search the contents of this safe. Um, the person is legally obligated to, um, you know, put in the passcode to the safe or produce the key to the safe or whatever. And um, if they don't, if they refuse to do that, even though a warrant has been presented to them, they can be, you know, they can be punished for breaking the law. Okay. Okay, I got it. Um, <laughs> so, the David David Comey, the FBI uh, director, you know, he's the one who came out and made all these made all these arguments. You know, basically saying that, uh, like, he railed on the post Snowden world that has arisen since people began caring about their privacy. <laughs> like, how could people care about their privacy? How could they? <laughs> How dare they? Yeah, man, this new world where Snowden ruined everything and made people <laughs> realize that all, all the crazy links that law enforcement is going to to basically scoop up all information all at once in this giant pool of, of just mass congregated data. How dare people uh, be against that? Jeez, thanks a lot, Snowden. Um, also, another thing I want to bring up on this topic is that I don't think Apple has actually... Um, made backdoor I just don't see that happening you don't think so no it's just um, it's no like conspiracy theory or anything um, I just think it's basic customer service thing that you know if some old lady accidentally encrypts her phone and t and takes it to the Apple store um, if they're unable to decrypt it then she's gonna make a big stink about it you know right I I can't imagine that they would make an option to encrypt their phones without putting a back door into it just because of the possible backlash they could have from people who, you know, aren't really technically inclined accidentally breaking their phones. Mm. Because, you know, they ac they accidentally encrypt it and then, you know, don't forget the password and, you know, they they turn their phones into like a thousand dollar brick. Right. Yeah, so you're saying that like it's it they're they're trying to fulfill a market demand, right? People want privacy, and Apple and Google are kind of fulfilling that by releasing um, privacy on by default, encryption by default. Well, Comey has a response to that as well. He's like, well, um, these companies are, are run by good people, both Apple and Google, and they're responding to what they perceive as a market demand. But the place they're leading us to is one that we shouldn't go to without careful thought and debate. The scary place that we're going to where there's privacy for every phone user. Um, um, well, there has been careful thought and debate. It's, you know, it's been uh, the entire year and a half since the Edward Snowden leaks. And um, the overwhelming, obvious answer answer to this debate is that people want privacy. People have thought long and hard about it for a year and a half, and they don't want people snooping in their private business. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know? that's like, why Google and Apple are responding to this with encryption. Because people want it. Yeah. But the, you know, the FBI guy is a complete idiot, as are most people in government. Um, and Apple and Google, I can't imagine them actually having a truly um, impossible, or a service that is truly impossible to decrypt. It, it just doesn't seem like good business to me. Hmm. Yeah, we'll we'll have to see what happens. Um, 
like I, I remember like Apple didn't didn't used to be a company that was all about privacy or even you know giving users like control over their own content like when the iPhone first released I got yeah. the first iPhone yeah they were all about ease of use that, yeah that's why that's why iOS is so locked down compared to Android right especially in the olden days when the iPhone yeah. like first released um they basically gave you like like it was a dozen or maybe even less than a dozen apps on your phone that you can choose from, you know, including texting and phone and all that. But like you couldn't um, download any extra apps. They were just the ones that you gave that they gave you. And then people start um, people jailbroke the phone to allow them to add in new tools and stuff like that. And people start making underground apps that you can only install once it's jailbroken. And then like this whole underground economy came up where people are making all these brand new like apps that do stuff that they didn't include in the original shipped phone and Apple's like wow this is uh this is yeah. something that we people can make want. a lot of money off of this yeah we can make a lot of money so then they set up the app store and that's where the app store came from so uh you know free market in action again i guess yeah that's why i'm partial to android because um my thing is why are you going to like what First off, why are you going to pay all this money for technology that is, like, so locked down? Um, and two, what is even the point of the technology if you can't do what you want with it? And that's, that's why I'm partial to Android because, um, you know, you, you can do pretty much what you want with it uh, from the get-go as soon as you take it out of the box. And Without then, jailbreaking or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, but if you, you know, if you do want... It's it's still somewhat restricted, um, but you can gain root access on an Android phone, and the process of doing that, from what I understand, is usually simpler than jailbreaking an iPhone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that makes sense. I haven't done it myself either, but that does make sense. It's probably yeah, pretty I've, straightforward. I've done it. I did it on one phone. It was the first smartphone I ever had. It was an Evo 4G from HTC, and um, you know, but then I got a. Uh, uh, Galaxy S4, and the software is so updated that just the default software without root access, just the phone out of the box, did more than my rooted Evo did. Huh. So yeah. and Android, you know, the Android OS is like gives you increasingly more freedom as as, as it's being developed, and um, I don't know, but I, it seems it seems like that could possibly be the way iOS is uh, leaning towards too because I I don't have any Apple devices at all so I don't know what like you know iOS 8 looks like or whatever version it's on now um, but I you know I remember like iOS 5 they introduced widgets to the notification panel mm -hmm. uh, so and you know three versions later maybe they you know they probably have added a lot more freedom in their OS yeah um, so yeah, best of luck to Apple and Google trying to, you know, uh, fulfill this market demand for privacy, this brand new market demand for privacy that, you know, whether it leads us to a dark place or not, <laughs> dark place, whatever that means, <laughs> like it is something that's needed and it's some people that, something that people want and it's going to get implemented. Um, I guess it'll just be interesting to see like if if you know some kind of law enforcement agency tries to force them to to put in a back door because that's been their mo for the past yeah, you know uh, several years that wouldn't be surprising at all to me yeah and i'm surprised that that hasn't happened yet you know um i mean i don't know i i welcome the dark place i mean it, it'll make my it'll make my dark wallet look a lot cooler <laughs> come to the dark side yep um Okay, so moving on to what is uh, probably our last story uh, for today. We're going to talk about something that happened actually about two weeks ago, um, but we didn't talk about because we didn't do a podcast last weekend, um, is that the Bitcoin bear whale striked <laughs> <laughs> and got slayed two weeks ago. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> he slayed by lo lots of people helped do this. Um so what the bear whale uh, basically is, is <coughs> two weeks ago, uh, people uh, on the Bitstamp Bitcoin exchange, um, you know, things are going pretty normally. Uh, prices had been dropping for a couple months already. 
and apparently someone pushed the price down even further, like in a sudden, you know, a sudden drop uh, down to the 300 range. And I'm not sure if it was the same person as the initial drop or not, but someone uh, put an order on Bitstamp to sell 30,000 Bitcoins uh, for $300 each. And until someone bought up all of those Bitcoins, the price stayed flat at $300 for hours on end. Because for hours, people were just buying up $300 Bitcoins one by one. And it wasn't dropping because um, cause anytime the price, anyone, anytime someone wanted to sell a Bitcoin for $299, someone bought it up almost immediately because it was the cheapest option, obviously. Um, but like 30,000 coins at $300, someone did this on purpose. Uh, like the motivations are kind of um, uh, in question as to whether they were trying to like cash out or manipulate the market or if it was just like an inexperienced uh, seller on the markets who like, you know, maybe mined Bitcoin a lot in the early days and doesn't really know how to mar use the markets that well and like just went on and sold 30000 at once. But because of that 30000 the price literally flatlined for hours at three hundred dollars and um pretty crazy like this no, nothing like this had ever happened before um on the bitcoin markets where the price literally just straight up flat lines at at one price and not just any price but an actual even you know yeah. 300 price 300 dollars. pretty crazy like, when i first saw it happen i thought bitstamp was broken yeah if you if you look at i actually thought bitstamp had shut down mm -hmm. um because i i had watched I didn't. I didn't know the whole Bearwell thing was going on um, the night of, and so I watched it, uh, and it was at like three hundred dollars for like three hours straight, and I was like, "Well, this is really weird." Usually, it fluctuates a little bit, but it's been exactly three hundred dollars. But I didn't think anything of it. Um, but then I woke up the next morning and opened up Bitcoin Wisdom to. Um, the opening price for the day for the weekly. Uh, Bitcoin price report I do for CoinBrief, and I, I saw that for um, I I do for the price reports I I use an hourly chart, and so I saw, you know, six bars denoting six hours, just six bars of flat activity. It looked like a, it looked like a big chunk had been cut out of the chart. Yeah, and and I was like, oh my god, what happened? Like, did did Bitstamp shut down in the middle of the night or something for like maintenance or something? Yeah. And then I got on Reddit. And um, I saw the Bearwell stuff, and it was just, and it was just hilarious. Like, uh, like I just reading the comments, like it, it was just. There's like a whole a, mythology built around. Yeah, it. It, it was the it was the most fun I had reading um, a thread in our Bitcoin like ever. <laughs> um, I think that was like the most fun I've ever seen the Bitcoin community have. Even though, even though it was about somebody messing with the price, which is like you know just the biggest, the most serious thing in the Bitcoin community. But I just thought it was really hilarious. People were like drawing pictures, and uh, like making stories, writing poems. Yeah, people make some really um, cool pictures depicting like a literal bear whale. Yeah, there was this one. There was this one painting i saw this guy did a painting and it was like uh this big ocean wave coming up and a giant bear well was coming out of it yeah and the and, guy um, slaying it he's got like a bitcoin uh shield and like yeah. a sword and, and then the, the waves uh, are in the was, shape was of, actually, the, of the price yeah, line the chart. yeah it was really <laughs> it was really good i think and, for that uh, I'll, I'll put that as the thumbnail for this for this video all right and, that would uh, be awesome <laughs> And um, I'll provide a link to the to the original work and like the, to to donate to that guy's Bitcoin address because that's pretty awesome and clever uh, artistic depiction of the bear whale. Yeah, yeah. When he when he like um, when I read that the wave like the lines or like the curves of the wave was actually like the price the line on the price chart. I was I was pretty impressed. That was really that was a really creative picture for pretty something silly. that was for something that was just absolutely silly. Yeah. Oh, uh, and uh, 
but some people actually took it really seriously though like there's there's this one guy who made a thread he was like i was right i've been talking about the bear well for six months and everybody everyone made fun of me and i was right and here's here's my proof that he's not actually dead yet and <laughs> and people in the comments are just like oh god al gore is at it again man bear well and yeah <laughs> I, it was just a fun couple days. Yeah, like people people who think like that, like do they think that 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 the same guy is coming back like every couple of weeks and selling like, like another thirty thousand bitcoins or something? Like, I think that's I don't that's know. doubtful. This, it's not the same guy. This one this one person I saw um, had like all this evidence that there was this one person who had been putting downward pressure on the price for months, and then and then. Um, he used that somehow and like extrapolated from that somehow that this guy still had more bitcoins and he was going to do another sell wall in the future or whatever. I don't know. My, my favorite theory is that some like 19 year old kid, um, mined, mined 30,000 bitcoins like back in, you know, 2009 when it was super easy to do it. And then he just woke up one day and remembered that he had them on his old laptop. Yeah. And so he just, he decided him he just decided that he wanted nine million dollars and sold them all. That's my favorite theory. That's definitely plausible. Yeah, it is, because there are a lot of people who mined bitcoins and just forgot about it because they weren't worth anything. Yeah. Um But then, you know, there's I don't But then like why stuff. why would you go on Bitstamp and and sell it? Because that like that like it pushes the price down a lot in that in that short time frame and like aren't there easier ways to sell like a mass amount of of bitcoin like couldn't you 9 million dollars worth i don't i don't think so but i actually think i actually think he was pretty smart about it because um like the whole the price drop leading up to the the sell wall that's all just speculation and i don't think there's any proof that there's actually one person who pushed the price from 460 to 300. Mm -hmm. um, but the $300 sell wall, I think that was actually pretty smart because he didn't actually push the price down. He prevented it from pushing it down by putting it all as one sell order. Oh, and, I got you. Um, and so, because and, if he had just done it in incrementally, like he, if he had just sold them one at a time or whatever, that would have pushed the price down. Hmm. Um, because people would have taken advantage of the arbitrage because they would have been like, oh, well, this guy sold one Bitcoin for this, so I'm going to sell this for incrementally less. And it would just be a chain reaction. But he put it all as one giant block at $300, so people had to buy all of that at $300. And uh, the price you know, literally couldn't go any lower than that. And then as we saw, there, there was so much excitement in the market afterwards that the price shot up to $400. Um, and it stayed in that area ever since. So I actually argue that that was actually you know a pretty smart method of selling that many Bitcoin, um, but yeah, I mean, but it's entirely possible if it was some kid who just remembered that he had thirty thousand Bitcoin, he probably didn't know anything about selling it, mm. um, because I, mean, I guess he doesn't know anyone he can just call up and be like, hey. Yeah, uh, Mr. Millionaire, I'm trying to sell you a big batch of bitcoins. Yeah, you know, and, and in the five years that have passed since he mined those bitcoins, this whole economy has popped up. So he probably just Googled like selling bitcoins or whatever, hmm. and clicked on the first exchange that came up. Hmm. Um, so, uh, what do you think about the theory that it might be someone from Coinbase or BitPay who is trying to lessen their Bitcoin reserves uh, that they you know collect over months and months of people? spending their bitcoins at merchants and the merchants um in most cases not keeping the bitcoin and in the vast majority of cases just keeping a, a very small minority in bitcoin so coinbase and bit bitpay end up collecting like tens of thousands of bitcoins in their reserves and they don't necessarily want to hold on to you know have a majority of their portfolio in that because it's too volatile so they have to go and sell it eventually um could they possibly do that on Bitstamp and, and maybe be one of these many bear whales that are causing these drops? <laughs> I actually hadn't heard that one yet. That's, that one's pretty interesting. But, um, you know, my initial reaction to that from hearing it for the first time just now is that it, 
if it was Coinbase or Bitstamp, um, BitPay. Yeah, sorry, BitPay. Wouldn't wouldn't this be happening like regularly all the time? Right. Um, because you know, surely those two companies make you know like more than nine million dollars. Like like merchant adoption took off like skyrocketed in the last like year or so. Um, sure, probably make more than nine million dollars a year, don't you think? Oh yeah, definitely. I think um, BitPay came out and announced like not even not even this year, but maybe late last year, like in the Bitcoin Black Friday madness, they were like doing a million dollars worth of transactions per day. I think that's what it was, and that would be pretty nuts. But um, like that doesn't necessarily mean that they would be going and selling all the time. They might um, build up like a large block and then go and and sell that like on the markets. And you know, I I've been curious about this for the past couple months. Like as merchant adoption has skyrocketed, how do they get rid of these excess coins in their inventory? Like I I imagine they probably have a lot of connections like um over the counter connections that aren't necessarily on the trading markets where they can just call up someone who is willing to buy millions of dollars worth of bitcoins but maybe in some cases they don't have that um kind of access and maybe have to go on the exchange to sell 30,000 um in one gigantic block um every every like maybe once a month or so um the the bear the the latest bear well thing at $300 the price only flatlined because the price was so low and there was so so much buying pressure below 300 that no one was letting it go below 300 except for maybe like one minute out of those three hours or six hours um so like these other cases where the price was dropping from like 500 to 400 and then to 350 like those those bear whales could be anyone, you know? It could be early miners. It could be someone from BitPay and, or Coinbase trying to lessen their reserves. Um, there's, there's a lot of possibilities for who these bear whales could be, and there's a lot of reasons for bear whales to exist. Um, yeah, it was just interesting to see this one bear whale flatline the price at 300 because it was, it was so low. Yeah, well, again, I, I think if it was... Coinbase or BitPay, um, if if they did something like this regularly, put up big, big sell orders for like big blocks of bitcoins. I think somebody would have noticed that a long time ago. The, the you know bit, Al Gore, Al Gore noticed. He's got well, the man I mean, bear whale. He's he's been following it for like six months, and he hasn't he hasn't. I don't think he's been following like I don't think he's been seeing like huge blocks of bitcoins being sold he probably just you know has been seeing the price fall and he's like everybody else on the bitcoin subreddit he yells manipulation every single time the price falls um which is another thing another point i want to bring up i i don't understand why um like why everybody just always assumes it's a bear well that's making the price go down you know, maybe it's just a lot of people selling Bitcoins. Maybe just a lot of people don't want Bitcoins anymore. They want to buy goods with Bitcoin or they want or they want cash, dollars. Well, um, a bear whale, like, literally is defined as just someone who's selling a, a huge, gigantic block of thousands of coins at once. Like, yeah, that, but, in that case, that well, is what, an individual doing that. Yeah, or at what, least an organization. What proof of that do we have? Like, where's the blockchain analysis... Where there's been people selling um, blocks of of bitcoins that are so huge it drops the price by hundred bucks. I haven't seen anybody ever bring anything like that forward. Well, you don't necessarily need blockchain analysis. You just you have the records on Bitstamp and other exchanges. So like, they see when like a thirty thousand sell order comes up, and they can see that that is that is one account on Bitstamp that is selling that. So that's that's one account selling a huge, like gigantic block all at once, and that's what they call a, bla- a bear whale. But you know how how often do we actually see that happening though? Is what I'd be interesting interested in in knowing. Yeah, 
Yeah. Because people people always talk about manipulation when the price goes down. They always talk about whales moving around. Um, but I've never seen any screenshots from the order books showing single orders for big amounts. Um, all I see is the price going down. And so uh, as far as yeah. I'm concerned, it's just people are deciding that they don't want their Bitcoin anymore. Um, I just don't. I just don't get why people always have to come up with a like a concrete reason for how the price is falling. Why it always has to be somebody deliberately manipulating the market in a negative way. Yeah, um, that's you then, know that's conspiracy the price, theorizing. That's not really necessary. But then when the price is going up, it's always legitimate growth. It's it's going to be completely sustainable forever, and nobody's manipulating the market at all. No, yeah, that that viewpoint is is is. Um, not correct but that that's an interesting theory but in order for me to believe it i would have i would need somebody to like um show me the actual sell orders that happen uh monthly from the same accounts uh mm. doing the same size blocks of bitcoin um until then i just don't believe it i yeah um i just all i see is you know individuals selling bitcoin yeah, and you know, going back to like our earlier discussion about financial privacy, in a way, like it's not really our business to find out who these individuals are, how many of them there are, what their reasons are for selling. Like it's kind of fun to speculate, but in when it comes down to it, it's not really our business why this particular person decided to convert, you know, their 30,000 bitcoins into 9 million dollars. Like, yeah, and it's not, it's not really it's not really a big deal either. Um, everybody always cries market manipulation, and they think somebody is trying to destroy Bitcoin by um, tanking the price. Um, but in reality, you as an individual manipulate the market every time you buy or sell something. Yeah. Uh, the only difference is that the Bitcoin market is so small um, that. It's possible for wealthy people to have huge amounts of influence on the market because they're just capable of making transactions that are big enough to waves. Yeah. Um, but it's it, it's not that they're doing it on purpose. It's just that you know they're making transactions like they would with anything else in their daily lives. Um, so yeah, like you said, they have. Nobody has any business knowing why people are doing that. Um, and it's not really that big of a deal that people are doing that because more than likely, it's just people dis like making mundane decisions on what to do with their money. Um, mm. It just so happens that some people are wealthy enough that a mundane decision is what to do with $9 million. Yep. Um, so, um, so, yeah, the whole, the whole like... <clears throat> market manipulation conspiracy theory thing that goes on on the bitcoin subreddit is it, it's just um I, it's it's funny but at the same time it really frustrates me because that that kind of thing like eats away at me because i think about stuff like that and it oh. just i don't like it yeah let let people do what they want to do uh, let them have the privacy to make transactions that they think is in their best interests and um, like market manipulation. What what do you define that as? Someone who's tries to plunge the price and then they can buy lower. Maybe, but that's yeah. you know that's how a lot of markets work. Yeah. That's how the so, stock market works too. So what too. if somebody does that? That's what we all hope for secretly. You know, we all want cheap bitcoins. <laughs> yeah. So why is why is it such a big deal that somebody's actually making that happen? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we may never know the true identity of the Bitcoin bear whale, just like we may never know the true identity of, of Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, and that's their right to stay private. And best of luck to them, to their um, financial uh, dealings and their millions of dollars in exchanges. Um, luckily, we just got this crazy story to, to have fun with and talk about <laughs> and awesome artwork to represent it as well. So um, that pretty much sums it up for this episode of the Coin Brief Podcast. Um, this has been episode 19. I'm Sean Wentz. I'm Evan Faggart. And we'll see you guys next week uh, with some more news in the digital currency space. Peace out.